Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture today comes from Mark 7, verses 24 through 37. Hear these words. From there he set out and went to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and she bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. And then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. And then he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epitha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. When I read these stories, I can't help but think of the times that I have traveled outside the country or even to other regions of this country. And if you've ever done this, if you've ever traveled to another country or another place in our country, you know what I mean. There's this moment, I call it the first step moment. And it's that first step moment when you first step off of the plane or you step off the train or the bus or out of the car that you know immediately there is something different. There are new smells, there are new sights, there are new sounds. This was my experience a few years ago when I traveled to Brazil. It was my first solo trip out of the country and I really didn't know what to expect. I was going to spend some time with a missionary family to learn about their work. And when I arrived, I was overwhelmed by the unfamiliar. I was met by the, met by the busy bustle of a airport that I didn't know. I was looking for my ride. I was trying to understand a language that I kind of understood. Every one of my senses told me that this was not home and told me that I needed to get back to my home. But I resisted and I stayed. 
Now, I have to admit that I felt a level of comfort when I arrived because I had traveled to other third world countries. I had been in South America before. So I kind of thought that I knew what I was going to see here. I figured that when I left the airport, we would go through town and we would see some areas that maybe were not so well off. And then as we moved away from that city center, we would get to an area maybe that was a little bit more modest. And then as we went further out, we might see even larger homes and more resources. But I was wrong. I was very surprised as we drove through the city center to see, instead of what I thought I would see, to see these large gleaming buildings, white tiles, beautiful colors, and plenty of resources. And when we arrived at the base camp for the missionaries, I was greeted by walls and a gate. And when we went into there, we encountered what was a modest home with a beautiful garden and a pool. To say I was surprised is an understatement. So later that night, as I was getting settled in and after worship, I was sitting and I was talking with my host and I asked them, I said, where are the places that are poor? Where's the poverty? Where is it that you actually do your work? And they said, well, we do go work in the city because there are places where we need to be in relationship with people. But the majority of our work is done on the edges of the city, on the outside, where the pavement ends. That's where we go to work along families. That's where the real poverty is. Those are the people that are kept out of sight. Kept out of sight. Those words rang in my head. You know, it's easy for us to leave places that make us feel uncomfortable, to leave them alone, to not go there. Human nature teaches us to circle the wagons, to stay with the group, to be in our place. We have Google Maps to help us navigate our routes, and people are quick to tell us whether or not it's safe to go somewhere. Without really trying, we can stay inside our camp, our space of living, and we can fail to see who and what lies outside of it, even if it's in plain sight. And this was the case in Brazil. And this is where we also find Jesus today. Outside of his camp is where we meet him. And there it is where we see how we might join him to share hope with the people. Now, you remember the story begins in the region of Tyre. And Jesus, he isn't here on a preaching tour, but rather the scripture says he went to get away. Jesus is trying to take a break. He doesn't want to be found, and after losing his cousin and feeding 5,000 people and ministering to countless of others, I imagine it's fair to say that Jesus was tired, and he was human as well as divine, so he needed a little vacation. So he traveled outside of his home territory to a place that was heavily populated by Gentiles. But as is often the case with Jesus, he no sooner gets there than word spreads that he's around and someone comes and finds him. And this time he is quickly sought out and found by a person with a desperate need. It's a woman, so a woman who is doubly an outsider, not only because of her gender, but also because she is a Gentile. She is an outsider to Jesus's community. And she comes to him and she says that her daughter is suffering with an evil spirit. And without intervention, we can assume that this daughter might die. And so this mother, like many other parents, is willing to do whatever it takes to save her daughter. Even risking going to speak to a man without first being invited. So she comes to Jesus pleading for help. And Jesus, hearing her, responds with really a statement that kind of makes us typically feel a little uncomfortable. He says, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, my mama would have gotten on to me for saying that when I was a kid. She'd still get on to me for saying that today. Jesus seems to be saying that his mission is only to the Jews, that he is only there for one group of people, and, and that the rest might be considered and the rest might be considered dogs. And many people chastised by this type of content comment would suddenly choose to probably slink away, to disappear, and to leave the matter alone. But not this woman. Instead, she boldly confronts Jesus and responds to him with even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs from the children. Her rebuke expresses her belief that she and her daughter are of value too. And hearing this, Jesus seems to be reminded that his mission is not just to one group of people, but is to all the world. And the daughter is healed. And from here, the story continues into another region, into another space outside of the religious center, a place outside of Jesus' home camp, his community, another place populated by Gentiles. And again, we have a double outsider coming to Jesus. This time, it's not a demon, but a physical impairment that makes this person an outsider from the community. Because you see, in those days when they didn't have science to explain why someone was deaf and mute, they thought that it was a consequence of sin. So we have this Gentile with with this impairment, and he's brought to Jesus by a group of friends who plead on his behalf for him to be healed. And this time, Jesus moves to action. He takes the man aside, and he lays his hands on his ears, and on his tongue, and calls upon God to release them. And the man is set free, and everyone is in awe. Jesus meets these people at the point of their deepest needs in the places where they are. He hears the cries of others on their behalf and responds with healing. He transforms lives, and as a result, he changes the spaces that the healed occupy within the communities, as well as the shape of the communities themselves. Jesus heals both physically and spiritually. He restores the health of the daughter and the man, and he responds... He restores the health of the daughter and the man... And he restores them to the communities. He restores them to life. And likewise, in the process, he restores the communities to them and to their families. He knows that this woman whose daughter is possessed by the Spirit most likely has been left out of the community. She's probably lived on the margins. She's probably not been invited over to people's homes. People maybe have even questioned, what has she done to deserve this. They kept a wide berth when passing her on the streets. And likewise, the man, the man who cannot hear and cannot speak is most likely overlooked and mistrusted. He's probably followed by the whispers of what did he do or what did his family do? He's cut off from his community, not only from his physical impairments, but because of his physical impairments. And so Jesus heals these individuals as well as the fracture in their communities that is caused by the impairments. He restores the people to God and to each other. And he sees the value of all of them as God's children. And as a result, we see the expansion of love beyond boundaries. Jesus knows our human nature. He lived it. He knows that we can easily overlook, leave out, ignore, and marginalize people. He knows that our ears can be stopped 
and our tongues twisted, that we may find it easier to be silent in a world that is divided into my camp and their camp. In the inclination, it's so natural that even Jesus needed a reminder that his mission was not restricted to one group. His mission was to God's camp, to all of creation. And this reminder came from where it so often does, from an encounter in an uncomfortable place, from a person who was most unlikely to be the one to share what really was the truth, from a person outside of the circle or the camp in a place where the maps don't take us and where few are willing to go. I caught a glimpse of this when I was in Brazil when we went beyond the base camp out to the edges of the city. As we traveled, I realized that the poverty I was seeing was really unfamiliar to me. What I knew of poverty, of being poor, only scratched the surface of what I was seeing that day. My host told me that not many people went to where we were going, that there were no stores there and very few resources, and the villages called favelas were pretty much just left to themselves. Remember, kept out of sight. They went on to say that when they first started going there, that the people didn't trust them and that they were skeptical. They'd had too many experiences with people coming there and then disappearing. But they kept coming, the missionaries, over time. They showed up over and over. And eventually, transformation occurred. The missionaries were welcomed into the community. The two were restored to one. And I witnessed this when I arrived. I stepped off the van and a little girl grabbed my hand immediately and began to show me her cow who was just walking in the middle of the street. And then we played games and we talked with parents who were struggling with decisions for their children. We prayed with a father who was looking for work. We shared food, community, and relationships. We read scripture and we sang songs. And we didn't wait for the people to come to us because most likely they would have never come that far. Instead, we went to them and we had church in that place. And that day, I saw lives that were changed. This is what happens when we follow the Spirit you see, the Spirit of God is always moving in and out of spaces and changing lives. The Spirit leads us to places and to people. And where the Spirit is present, borders fall away and space opens up for God to do a new thing. Transformation occurs. Transformation occurs because of the love of Jesus. And throughout Scripture, we see the theme of mission to the world. God has a mission. Humanity has a mission. Israel has a mission. Jesus comes with a mission. And the church is the extension of the mission. Jesus shows us through his life, death, and resurrection that we are part of his mission. Throughout his life, we find him in places that are not always populated with the religious people, but we also find him in places where people know little about faith, about the religious center. And when Jesus died, he didn't die in the religious center, but instead he died beyond the walls in a place where those who were outsiders who were on the margins lived, and he died between two outsiders, criminals. And at the resurrection, he commissioned his church, the people, to carry the good news to the world. The, writers of, the writer of Hebrews reminds us in chapter 13 that we are to go now to him who is outside the camp and to join in his suffering. 
to join in his suffering, to do the hard work of being with the people and sharing the love of Christ. And we, just like these hearers of this letter, are invited to join Jesus in the work. We're invited to go beyond our religious centers to places that may not feel comfortable, to places that might feel different, to people who we don't know, but who are of value to God. The goal of all mission in Scripture is that creation should flourish because of God's generosity. And this is why Jesus healed and loved the people, both physically and spiritually, on the edges, outside of the camp. And we are called to do the same. The world teaches us to shun the dirty, to cross the street, to move away. But Jesus teaches us with word and action to strive for compassion and mercy and to offer community with him and with one another. And this is what he did when he saved us. When he transformed our lives, we were empowered to share his transformative love with the world. His care for others affirms and anticipates the church's need to share God's gifts of love, mercy, grace, and peace. Jesus calls us to be the church. Jesus calls us to be instruments of healing. But what clogs our ears and silences our tongues? What keeps us inside the camp? Is it our fears, our schedules, our worries? It's easy to become deaf to Jesus' call, mute to sharing the gospel, and possessed by our places of comfort. But these stories today, they are a word of hope. A word of hope for those of us who have blocked ears, twisted tongues, and stuck bodies. They are stories that remind us that Jesus came to set everyone free. There are stories that remind us that Jesus came to set us free. And when we respond to the gospel, our ears are open, our tongues are released, and our bodies are freed so that we can share the hope of freedom and glimpses of this grace, healing, peace, and love. Jesus took a wide-ranging trip outside of his community beyond the geographic and ethnic limits of the Jewish people. And when he did, lives were changed and church happened. Fred Craddock, a minister, once wrote that two things are absolutely essential for the church to happen, Jesus Christ and human need. In that place where the church dwells are the rich and the poor, the have and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. There are those who are educated and those who are not. There are those who believe and those who don't believe. There are the high and the mighty and the lowly who nobody knows. In between is the church of Jesus Christ, and the church is called to help both the have and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. The church is to be the gospel for all people. And as long as you have Christ, and as long as you have needs, you have the church. I believe that this is a community that Jesus calls us to be. One that is willing to meet people where they are, with their deepest needs, a community with open ears and loosened tongues that willingly shares the good news of Jesus outside the camp, wherever that may be, offering healing, a community where love and mercy flow and restoration occurs, a community that offers hope through word and action that offers people and invites them to experience the gift of life through faith in Jesus Christ. There are hurting people in this world, people that are outside of the camp. Some look just like you and me and some do not. 
But we can't continue to wait for them to come to us. Instead, it's time for us to make that choice to follow Jesus and go to them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.